And I'm sure some of you have been to um, the two previous talks, but um, uh, if not, I just wanted to say that the format is generally uh, giving the artist a chance to speak a bit about their work, um, followed by a QA. and a And uh, I would just request that um, if we could pass the mic around for any questions, because we are recording the conversation for posterity. Um, just uh, wave your hand, uh, whoever's ready to speak, and I will uh, pass the mic. So without further ado, here is Ashley Landerham. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I should start off by saying I spend a lot of time in general looking and mulling over um, construction sites. And I've, what I find about, uh, fascinating about construction sites are all the barriers. So there's the first chain link fence, and then there's that orange square pattern of another barrier. And then... Uh, what, I, what I enjoy most is the scaffolding that it's this ex exterior skeleton that holds up this dilapidated architectural facade. It's very vulnerable and strong at the same time. And I think I, I try to take all those, um, all those aspects and put them in my work. So generally what what happens is I start out with a shape in, in a drawing. I do, do a lot of sketching. And I, I take the shape and turn it into a pattern. So I turn it, I bend it, I spin it in space to try and make a three-dimensional drawing in space, basically. And this is to create a structure, a... Uh, an armature, if you will, uh, that encases, that encloses space in a way that is intriguing, that's inviting, um, that's open enough to invite the viewer to uh, project themselves uh, psychologically into the encasement. And model, I make a few models. Um, and then I pick a pattern based on the, that uh, armature. So the pattern is, um, I would say that the pattern is not, it's, it's not a mirror of, of the structure, but more um, like a synonym. So the, the pattern is a secondary pattern on top of the pattern of the structure. Um, and that, again, is, is supposed, to, uh, in, supposed to invite the, the viewer to be, mm, to be, it's supposed to be seductive uh, and on top of a very strong, um, uh, a strong, uh, almost um, defensive structure. So it's it's this balance between um, like self segregating and and um, alluring, basically. Uh, and the colors I choose are are along that same vein. Um, let's see. So d depending on which, uh, which material used for the structure, um, for, the, for the skeletal pattern, uh, allows, um, dictates what material I use for the, the skinning of the sculpture. Uh, what else can I say? Mm. So like for this one, I was really interested in using this decorative, almost old-fashioned fabric on on such a like a uh, a heavy, very geometric uh, armature, and I I chose to. Uh, 
make it taut in a way that allows for a rippling and a, and a vulnerability, like I mentioned earlier, a, a femininity, um, as, as well as uh, more of a, an embra it's an embrace of, of the geometry, really. Um, and the, the panels are hand dyed in three different tones. Mm. And uh, I've heard that, I've heard other people mention uh, they envision it rolling across the room and and I and I like that visual, but I I like to think of it more as a constriction and a like more breathing. I think um, that's that's an excellent uh, introduction to the to the work. Are there questions for Ashley that we can delve in a little deeper, perhaps? Oh, that's a uh, that's a toughie, but goodie. <laughs> well, it starts it starts with the armature, and I let the I let the 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 structural component dictate what color that that might be, and um, I can't. It's more of an intuitive choice, but once that once that selection has been made, then the secondary materials are chose, chosen based on that as either analogous or um, within the same family, just to make it more of a whole. I was wondering what material you use. Is it metal? Is it plastic? And do you it's, build it yourself? It's steel, steel. yes. Steel? And yes. you weld it yourself? Uh, I didn't weld this one in particular, but I, I had help. But Darn. yes, I do weld. Okay, thanks. I wanted to know, is the inspiration for this piece, um, was it from one construction site that you saw, or is it from many that you see? Oh, no, it's just in general. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm fascinated by those barriers and that vulnerability. Um, because I, I think ultimately it's just more beautiful. I think the... I think that that limbo is 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 much more rewarding than the finished stucco. You know those layers, the layers I, I'm into. Do you, you find that from uh, inspiration from just construction sites or, or lots no, of other things? No, no, just <laughs> no. I just anything involving that kind of um, that kind of removal. And um, so, what would be another example of an inspiration? Um, say, I mean, use construction sites as an example, but well, I, I just I just watched an, a TV episode where uh, uh, so someone was explaining how someone else was. They said um, she gets off on being withholding. So I. I, I I, I really liked that description. <laughs> Not about me, about the sculpture. <laughs> um, we can imagine also a person as a construction site, mm -hmm. as we built ourselves. Then could it be like the metaphor of a state of mind? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I think that's how scale comes into play. Yeah, because that's the scale of a body. Mm -hmm then it's like you invite us mentally to be in that state of mind. That seems comforting. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. It, it, I'm intrigued by this idea of the construction side again, but <laughs> really more having to do with the fact that it's such a male-dominated site, you know, mm. and That's your true. work, in a way, is so feminine. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of talk about that a little bit about this kind of play of material and and uh, do you do you consciously kind of think about the gender issue in your work? Does that come into play? 
I don't think so much about gender, um, and not even in in relation to construction, but I would say that uh, you know the materials that I use, uh, steel. Uh, they, they can be heavy-handed or um, weighty in a, in, in a way that could be seen. But I, I don't, I just, let's see. I think more about, humani about humanizing the material than about assigning them any kind of gender role. Um, or, or humanizing the structure. Yeah. Um, when you build these objects, how do you think of them in relationship to the body? Because you talk about these construction sites that are a little bit kind of on edge and we feel this kind of this dilapidated building, but also mm -hmm. these structures that maybe are false at the same time, but you build a very strong structure that mm -hmm. has, is tent-like with feet and it invites this idea of play. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. like how you connect these ideas or how you think about the body with this. I don't think about them as being, they're not figurative sculpture, but they, are, but they do uh, contain space in a way that, uh, that could hold a figure. Right, I'm talking about the yeah, relationship to the body not being figurative. Oh, um, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The the scale is usually directly related to the the scale of the figure, or my scale in particular. Um, I think that it's it's partly because it's an easy it's just an easy way for me to make that decision to to work as as far as measurements goes. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I think that the envelopment of the space is, should be uh, suggestive in such a way that is um, comforting. Do you ever think about how, where your pieces could be in environmentally? Like the, the materials that you use are, kind of a mix of, of vulnerable and, and very durable and strong that where they could uh, survive the elements at, in, in a, mm -hmm. even a different climate than here where we are. But the fabric, it looks delicate. It, it wouldn't last through a winter in right. Chicago, for instance. Right. You know, um, do you, is that intentional? Or could you speak to that? Yes. Um, I, I like the, that conflation between the two the two materials. Uh, these aren't uh, these aren't outdoor sculptures, and uh, I would choose different materials, and therefore a, a completely different sculpture. Or, but um, I have done a few outdoor works. I find it interesting that um, it's a combination, to me, of a hammock, which is about relaxation, a teepee, which is a form of shelter, and I see it as a, a very much like a toy mm. as well, something that you know you can play around with. And I love um, the uh, opposite end where you um, chose to do it like you were doing formal drapes. Mm -hmm. Is that, I don't know if that, I mean, that's the way it looks from here. Sure, the rippling. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. So that also is um, a point, of, I think, of safety. At least, you know, that's what it resonates with me. Thank you. Yeah, I've gotten anything from, uh, let's see, a adult playpen to um, a Catholic confessional. So. That piece is downstairs. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Right. Maybe not this one, but. But but those those are apt. Those those analogies are apt. 
Uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued between the conversation with the pattern of the fabric and the pattern in the mm -hmm. structure, and I, and I keep on going, so what was first? You, you started with the fabric, and then, or how did that? The structure is first, so the, this, oh. and, then the, and then the material and pattern is based on that structure. So did you have the fabric uh, uh, created? No, this is off the shelf, oh, okay. yeah. Um, but I always have that option. Any other questions? Again, the, another piece of Ashley's is downstairs that we should take a look, about, look at as we uh, descend to the main gallery. But um, if there are no other questions, uh, let's go down and talk to Heather Gwen Martin. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Again, thank you uh, for coming out tonight. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Heather Gwen Martin to you, whose three paintings here on the wall behind, uh, behind me, in front of you. Um, and uh, here is Heather. Hi. So I guess I'll just get started. Um, I'm very much interested in the human aspect of painting and the human aspect of making a painting. Um, I know that's a really wide statement to kind of make, so maybe I'll go ahead and talk about a few things that'll uh, form the structure, not necessarily that the paintings sit firmly within, but you know, a, a foundation that um, they sort of float into and out of from time to time and um, maybe make a little more sense. And then I can go ahead and come back and talk specifically about the pieces here. Um, closer to the mic. Closer, okay. <laughs> okay, but I don't need to start over though, right? No, All right, good. <laughs> And so when I, when I talk about the human, I mean it um, sort of in the relationship between, say, like human and machine or human and technology, or then leading on to, like, say, how the human functions itself as a machine in a sense or a system, and, and sort of a reaction to thoughts about that. Um, when I started focusing on painting some time back, um, I was also becoming very much interested in things that were happening with um, study of the brain um, in cognitive science and, and neuroscience. There were um, a lot of really exciting things happening with um, mapping of the brain and being able to actually see the physical changes in the brain like with response to different activities or different stimuli and, and this sort of thing. So I had a pointed interest in that as well as sort of ideas of brain plasticity. And this isn't to say that I was any sort of wizard or, 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 or you know, scientist, but I had a very strong interest in this and started becoming interested in it on a personal level. Um, at the time I was a student, but I was also um, working at a comic book company and coloring comic books, which at the time was done, or how I was doing it was all on the computer and was a very visual process, um, but with the tool being the technology of the computer and the, the software that was used to do this. Um, so I was interested in, in being there and doing this activity over and over. And it was a really cool job to have, and there were great people there, but um, it started to feel at times like I was a robot, just because the way you have to operate to make the things happen, um, just commands and this sort of thing it becomes um, robotic in a sense, or that's how I was feeling about it. So I was, I was starting to pay attention while I was making the paintings. I was interested, so how is this affecting me when I go back to the very um, simple, direct means of painting, like just a brush, canvas, very traditional materials? Um, I wasn't looking necessarily for an answer or to come to any solution, but it was really interesting to me just to see if I was affected and then to take that and filter it through just a very human process. Um, so I was painting for a while, and then through the painting I started to become interested more in some of the physical things that were happening with um, like visual effects, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, instances where, where colors meet and they sort of vibrate or or move around, and um, instances like where after imaging, I never knew really whether other people were seeing these things in, in the paintings, but I was noticing them happening while I was working. 
and becoming interested in that and how, how I and perhaps other people would develop a physical relationship with a painting that was um, sort of just happen in a sense. If you relax and let it happen, it's not something you necessarily think about, though it's something you may realize, just the way that you process the visual information. And I was interested in a way how that separated maybe like the real experience of being like close to the work, like in person as opposed to seeing it filtered through like as an image or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and um, so I kept painting <laughs> and, and then um, the more I'm still very much interested in all the research that's going on with the brain and mapping things, and I was a guinea pig at times for people's research projects, which were really exciting, and you know, measuring emotional response or physical responses to stimulus. But in all of that, I've come now to sort of be more interested in the otherly about a human, like the things that are um, not measurable or hopefully never will be that make us separate or, um, you know, less logical or something in a sense. Um, and how we make decisions that are maybe um, moves and decisions based on other things that aren't logical or sensical. Um, and how that, how that translates into different things in everyday life and in, say, making a painting or, you know, music, these sorts of things. Um, sort of how we're separate still from, from a machine thing and that will never happen. Um, I should have brought water, but I didn't. <laughs> um, there's a machine, um, Watson, that I think IBM came up with some years ago. Thank you. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. I'm not an expert on it by any means. Like none of this was meant to be like, oh, I'm gonna set up this hypothesis and solve problems or whatever. It was more just what I was noticing as I was working and, and was interesting me about the work or things that were going on around me, I felt like. Um, so anyway, Watson was this computer. I think he takes up like two rooms or something. It's huge. And IBM made him, and he's most famous for, and I think he was created actually to play Jeopardy. And he played against like the All-Stars, and I believe he won. I watched it, it was pretty interesting. But you know, all the, he arrives at all the answers based on these associations that are more or less um, logical, or they've been programmed, you know, there's algorithms and stuff, you know, it makes sense in the way that it's created. And so I'm interested in how we make decisions that are less so, um, see if I don't totally slaughter this. There's a movie from like 2000 <laughs> and called High Fidelity, and it's totally just like a popular culture kind of movie, John Cusack's in it and he owns a record store in Chicago. And his girlfriend just broke up with him, he's kind of in the dumps. And I don't know if I can do this well. <laughs> but there's a scene where, you know, he's all bummed out and he's in his apartment organizing his record collection. And his buddy comes by to kind of try to get him to go out to go to a show. And his buddy walks in and he's like, so, looks like you're organizing your record collection. What is this, chronological? No, it's not alphabetical, autobiographical. <laughs> no effing way. Yeah, I can tell you how I got from Deep Purple to Howlin' Wolf in just 25 moves. And if, if I wanna find the song Landslide by, uh, by um, why am I blinking now? Fleetwood Mac, <laughs> Fleetwood Mac, I have to remember that I put it in the stack to give away to someone in 1983, but decided not to for personal reasons. <laughs> and so to me, that's like really exciting way of like organizing or creating a system like it's based on all this other stuff coming in, you know, and maybe it's not sensical, but it's interesting. And so I'm really interested in how that plays in like myself for making paintings and other things like music and that sort of thing. But lately I've noticed like in, on a very personal level, again, just um, how some of my decisions are becoming quicker or um, more conscious versus less conscious and how the play, they play off each other. And I don't know how much that matters to anyone else, but basically in the process of making the work, how that excites me and I feel like I find you know, more things that I wanna focus on. Um, 
like this piece, I guess, I don't know if this is something that anyone else even sees, except I do have a friend who, <laughs> who said it was the first thing he noticed when he looked at it. There's this, on this piece I started um, putting this yellow part in, and it was a darker yellow to start with. And I can't remember, I think this was already here, I painted this, and then I noticed, oh, there's like this weird, like, pink red line going around the, the yellow, you know, and to me it was like mirroring, they sort of playing off of it. And it hadn't been intentional, but I don't know whether it's something that I, I knew at all was going to happen just from things I've done before or not. But I decided to play off it, and you know, I, ha I lightened things, balanced things, shifted the colors to try to, to play off it. And um, I'm not sure what my point was, other than it wasn't something that I'd planned, and um, it wasn't a logical step necessarily, but then I combined that with something that made sense to me, and I'm interested in how that balances out and leads to new things, I guess. Questions for uh, when you do these pieces, is there any pre-planning or does it just happen? Well, I think that's sort of what I just was saying. That there, there's sometimes an idea or something going on and then it sort of is coupled with things that just happen. And then sometimes the responses to that these days sometimes are really coming really quickly and I'll just go with it, where in the past maybe I would have like hummed and hawed a little longer. So I'm interested in that play. There is some stuff that's sort of a hunch or something I want to start with and then they play off of, you know, more immediate response or something that's more thought about. I don't know. Hi. Hi. Um, it's wonderful. That's really congratulations. Thank you. I want to ask you if you wanted to elaborate just a tiny bit about the figures, just just the figure. I mean, you've been talking about the subconscious and the human part mm -hmm. and the anti-robot thing and all of it. <laughs> but of course, you're saying that it just happens there. But if you can, if you wanted, just give me just half a minute about the figures themselves. Sure. Well, I mean, some of them they're they're kind of a combination of. Um, sort of representations either of something that started as a concrete thing or these more abstract ideas of like forces or energies or movement or something. Um, so in that sense, in a way, they're a representation. It's just whether it's representation of a concrete thing or something that's more imagined. I'm interested in how they come together and, and you know, kind of push each other around. And, and I mean... I'm interested in creating that some sort of energy that's happening making the painting and if any sort of that resonates afterwards in terms of like an energy or a, a something. But I don't really know. I'm just, as I go along. <laughs> Do you consider yourself an underpainter? Come again? Are you an underpainter? Do you have layers before mm. you finalize the surface? Yeah, yeah. Pretty much everything has many layers. Silly layers. <laughs> and do you start on the floor and move to the wall, or do you all, do all your work on the wall? It's all on the wall. Yeah, there's you, most things, sometimes the color or, or, or shape or something will stay pretty much the same from the start, but a lot of times there will be subtle shifts between the layers, changing the shape or hues or values, kind of just trying to play them off of each other. Nice. Thank you. Anyone else? It's just, it's just really interesting the way you talk about it, the underneath, under, underpainting, having silly layers and all this kind of emotional drive sort of behind what you do and reactionary to what else is going on in your world at that time. But you're, the, it's so, it looks so pristine and controlled and perfect and beautiful like it's just it's kind of just an observation I guess I'm not really asking a question <laughs> it's really interesting thank you do you find that um, as you produce more and more of these pieces that you have or you sort of stumbled into um, like a reference or like a library or like an alphabet of strokes and or shapes that you sort of revert to? Not intentionally, but yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens. Um, I mean, yeah. I see like this little sinewy sort of red lines that connect things or this on this other one on the left, pink or blue. Um, they just, they, they feel like, um, I mean, it feels like it's a line you use constantly 
to do something. So like, like you know, that would be like a letter that you form a word with in the paintings. Yeah, um, I mean, they're definitely a reappearing sort of thing, but it isn't meant to necessarily symbolize anything in particular, but I mean, I'm interested in how the line sort of, when I'm making it, you know, to me it's sort of like navigating around a little bit. Hi, I grew up with comic books, so for me, you're like a fabulous storyteller. Like I see so much like little stories and things and comic book characters coming to life and motion and alive. And I'm interested to know what your literary influences are for these works or in general in your life, because everything, everything has to do with the stories, right? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think different people likely project differently, and I wouldn't call, I, I don't necessarily have any specific literary references, though, I mean, I, I read, but I read really weird, varied things. I like, like, Americana novels, and I also like scientific texts, and lately I've been reading all these texts on, like, teaching algebra and mathematical kind of things, and so I don't know that there's any one I could point to. Um, but yeah, I guess it's kind of a broad spectrum between kind of technical things and things that are really sort of otherly or human kind of, you know, classic novel type things. Anything else for Heather? Very good. Well, we're going to have to squeeze into the next room, but thank you very much, Heather, for you. your introduction thank to you. the work. Okay, everyone, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Krifka. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Thank you. <laughs> so this is Laura Krifka, and these are her three paintings and two sculptures, and uh, she's going to tell you all about them right now. Hey, guys. I feel like a bride, this is my little bouquet. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is talk about the work chronologically and how my ideas kind of flowed from painting to painting. Uh, the thing I was thinking about when I started work on the show was the idea of predator versus, versus prey and different ways that I could show that. I wanted to show it, one in just like a physical way, one in more of an emotional way, and then one in a really personal way. Uh, so the first painting I did was The Lurk. Uh, there were a couple things that inspired the painting. First was I went to LACMA and looked at paintings at a museum. Uh, it was the Caravaggio show, Caravaggio and his pals. And uh, one of the things I loved about that show that I hadn't really seen in that condensed of a format was light sources contained within the painting, not just like holy light from God, but like a candle or a moment. So I thought, shoot, I want to learn how to do that. Uh, I really like to put things in my paintings that I don't already know how to do and see if I can pull it off. Uh, so I wanted to have a contained light source in my painting. And the second thing was I really wanted to paint that nightgown. Uh, it was a nightgown that my grandmother made. And uh, it was given to me when I was like 13. And I love that nightgown. And every time I see it, I think it should be in a painting. So my dear beautiful cousin was coming to visit me and I thought, Caroline, you need to get in grandma's nightgown and pose in my living room. So uh, I just had some fun and did a photo shoot and saw what, what came of it. And after a few months of it sitting on the back burner, I was ready to make the painting. So what I, what I really wanted to do was play with the idea of different lighting ideas. So we have the really hot, warm light hitting her from below and then the really cool moonlight hitting her from above. So you have the moment of, okay, is she, is she out in the wilderness searching for somebody? Did somebody that she want run away? Uh, or is she herself being pursued? And then you also have the idea of the cool light versus the warm light conflicting each other. So it's a really formal idea. So that is the lurk. Next painting is the big red painting. Uh, <laughs> so also at the show, at the LACMA, there was the Stanley Kubrick show, and 
I love movies. I love movies so much. I love set design and lighting, and I love Stanley Kubrick red, and I really wanted to do a red painting. I've been thinking about doing a swing set painting for about three years, uh, and I just, I like to let things sit and simmer and wait for the right moment, and finally the moment had come and I was ready to do the painting. Uh, I didn't know how many figures I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted a female figure, and I knew that I wanted male figures. Uh, I decided that my female figure needed to be clothed. I'm very interested in the idea of power, who's in control, uh, and also things that relate to the body in ways that we control the body. There's this great book by Baudrillard on seduction, uh, and he talks about the, the power of seduction is all about the unknown, that once once you see the naked body, it's not as intriguing as when it's under the lingerie. Uh, so I wanted to make my version of that in my painting. Uh, and then I also started thinking about my role as an artist. Uh, you know, people meet me and I seem like a nice gal, but I'm super creepy. <laughs> and I, I felt like, how do I? <laughs> Uh, so I, I thought I should make a painting about how I'm such a total creep and a lech. Uh, you know, I, you look at paintings and you see male figures around a nude female figure like lunching on the grass and you think a lot about, you know, the, the identity of the male figures and like ownership, that they're showing ownership of her body. But really, like the artist is the one who did it. He's the one that we're talking about. It was what was in his mind. So this painting is kind of about what's in my mind. So we have our lecherous male figures surrounding our sleeping lady. Uh, and through framing, even though she's the one that's naked and they're pulling up the skirt, we get like a pretty little crotch shot here and here. And really, they're the only ones that we can see anything of. So that's my little gift to you all. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> um, and I, I love flowers, I love the decadent. Actually, I should back that up. I hate the decadent, and I think that things that we hate are really powerful. Um, I remember first coming in contact with Rococo painting, because I like, I love David, and um, the paintings of like Death of Marat, and then I researched what paintings came before that in France, and it's the Rococo, and it's Fragonard, and the swing, and flowers dripping, and light, da -da -da -da. Like that's the, when you look at those paintings, you hear da -da 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 happening in your brain. And I was so repulsed by them. You know, I love like dark, like heavy structure, so intense and so deep. Uh, and then I looked at those flower paintings and it was just disgusting. And I think that sometimes the things that are the most repulsive to us can be the most powerful. So I started playing a lot with decadence in my work and throwing in the dreaded flowers. And then the flowers became something else. They became fleshy and dare I say it, vaginal. Uh, moments where you can see through petals to the things beyond it, and the whole painting becomes this predatorial female object, because I'm a girl, and I'm a predator. Uh, not really, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so then I was working on the sculptures. Um, I make pretty things. I'm interested in beauty. I think beauty is powerful, and also seductive, and the things that seduce us can be terrifying. Um, the, the way in which we let the wool get pulled over our eyes uh, is important, and it's important to be aware of those things. And I think one of the ways that you can talk about beauty uh, is to have moments of corruption. Maybe you can have a painting like this that's pretty tame, nothing's really going on, uh, but the you know, somewhat scary lighting. And then you can have a sculpture like this, um, this is called In Bloom, where, where it pushes it over the edge and it corrupts the images that are around it. Uh, for this sculpture, I just really loved the sound of the words flowers tumbling out of her open mouth. That just kept going through my mind, so I wanted to make a sculpture about it. And I liked the idea of, like, it's a pretty sort of female nude reclining, but it also implies this ritual, kind of like in Silence of the Lambs, when uh, he puts the moth in the victim's mouths, and that's how they solve the case of the buffalo killer, uh, or whatever it was. Um, I like the idea of implying that someone had to sneak up and put 
the flowers in her mouth. It implies a story. Uh, whereas over here, we have Sneak. Sneak was originally going to be a naked man crouching, and uh, I decided that it was too obvious because naked men love crouching. <laughs> I, I felt like I needed to be something different, and I realized that so much of the, the show was about being a woman and being, you know, being kind of sneaky. And so I wanted to make a painting or a sculpture about that kind of sneakiness. And um, I also really love weird American history Americana, and I love pantaloons. Uh, I like the stories that dress can imply. I don't own any pantaloons. I can see it in your eyes. Um, but my little figure does. And so I like the idea of, uh, of her kind of breaking away from her uh, caravan of covered wagons, like sneaking through the forest and getting down and looking through the, through the leaves. Uh, and I, I think I make stop animations and I, I feel like this is the piece that's leading to my next stop animation of a kind of, you know, Lord of the Flies, Girls Gone Wild, break away from the caravan <laughs> in the American wilderness. So she saw it first. Uh, and then the very last painting that I did was, was Mother. Um, th this was on the L.A. Louvre blog, but I was, the, the images I was thinking about were, well, let's start, the idea I was thinking about was the desire to have a baby and the total fear of being annihilated when you have a baby. This is very personal stuff, guys. So, <laughs> just, it's, it's intense. Um, you, you want it, and then you have people tell you that you might ruin your entire career. Uh, that's the real thing that gets said, and it's, it's scary because you don't want anyone to ever tell you what to do, but it means your whole life is gonna change. I'm 28, and I thought I should make a painting about being 28 and thinking about these things. So that's what the painting is about. Um, you think of paintings like Mary Cassatt, mothers and children, like they're in the bath, or it's a blue dress, and she's sitting on the chair, and it's like, it's so precious. And then you think of Goya's Saturn devouring his young, and he's like, rah, and it's like there's a butt, and like blood's dripping down. Um, and I, I love that painting so much. Uh, so... <laughs> So I really, I love all the angles in that painting. Like it's all elbows and knees. So I wanted to do something that was about softness and like ideas of femininity, big swollen breasts and nipples just sticking out. Uh, and then that jaggedness, that intrusion of limbs. So I made this painting Mother. Uh, if you guys can't tell that demon baby on her back is me. That's a self-portrait. You guys are the only ones that'll know. Uh, I thought that that was particularly poignant for me. <laughs> I am my own demon on my own back. Um, and I, I just love the idea of, you know, mocking and making light of the thing that terrifies me most at 28. Thank you, any questions? <laughs> Questions for Laura? No, I just gonna say I think you're brilliant. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, I love what you said about um, kind of like your obsession with that which repulses you. That really, it's really resonated with me and I think a lot of people here. And um, also, I just had a question, really random, but about the faces yeah. of, the, of the male figures in that painting. What do they represent and where did you get them from? The one nearest to me looks like Kesha. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's who should know. <laughs> um, that was my theory. But. Yeah, I'll just go with that. Um, so they, they come from a lot of different things. I'm, I'm like obsessed with art history. Mm -hmm. uh, but it started with first, I, I make sculptures, like little tiny people. So, so similar to these? Yeah, similar to these, oh, cool. a different material, but very similar to these. Okay. But the difference is, is I can't sculpt things like eye sockets and all that information. Mm -hmm. So this is, parts of these are me and my husband's body parts. Just okay. here, nothing below, okay. but <laughs> I swear. Um, so it's moments like that. And then I just steal stuff from my friends. Mm -hmm. Like this is my friend Patrick's lips and he doesn't know. And he didn't come to the talk tonight, so he'll never know. Um, and 
also, I, was just, I forgot to write down the name of the artist, and I can't pronounce it, but it's this painting, uh, Cupid and Psyche, where okay. he, the, he, oh, it's so good. It's so I, good, you guys. He has like his hand wrapped around her head, uh -huh. and it's this exact same pose. Uh -huh. Uh, and I just really loved like that kind of predatorial face looking down. So totally. it's a, it doesn't look like him, but there's like a little wink to that. Okay, cool. That answers my second question, which is like, why do the bodies feel disjointed? And yeah, why. and I'm because one of the things I like about being a painter is I exert total and complete control. Mm -hmm. And my bodies, if you've probably noticed, are highly distorted. Mm -hmm. I, I like to think that their entire anatomy as people are formed to exist in one pose only. Mm. So like, like how this connects to this is pretty insane. Yes. Like that doesn't make yes. any sense. Yes. Uh, but I, I kind of also think of him a little bit like like a serpent, Garden of Eden style. Totally. Like I can even do it. But it's yeah. like that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. How old were you when you knew you wanted to be an artist? When I was six, I wanted to be an artist, cowboy, missionary. I accomplished one of those goals. So always, yes. Thanks. Uh, I love these paintings. I think they're absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And um, I've looked at this several times because I've been back. And I'm fascinated by that, the shape of the red. Between the face, yes. Yeah. And, and the fact that that pose, uh, you actually talked about the serpent, but it, it, it makes the, the middle face um, a beast, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and this other one uh, also. But I just wondered how that came about. I mean, did that... It took a really long time. <laughs> uh, it took a lot of sketching. The, this painting was maybe like seven different versions. And then I built the sculpture and then I took photos of the sculpture, and then I, I went back three different times. Initially, there was, um, like, see those dark silhouetted branches? There was a really large silhouette back here. And then I was like, no, that has to go. And then I pulled it out, and I was like, yay, I did it. That's, the, that's it. So it's, it's just nonstop intense editing uh, f preceded by no rules, creativity, whatever I want to do, how much fun I want to have in the time that I have in my studio. Well, yes. I don't need mic. It's okay. No mic? Okay. It's okay. This figure here in this painting is uh, really fascinating to me because it's almost voyeuristic, but also very um, challenging. I mean, it really is confrontational. Mm -hmm. Is that in Oh yeah, um, yeah. I, I really don't like to do a lot of direct eye contact in my paintings. Like my figures usually are looking off because I mean them to be objects to be consumed only. Uh, and recently I've started flirting again with the gaze. And so I wanted this painting to be about the gaze. So we have um, our very confrontational male figure and he's lifting up the skirt and basically he's lifting up the skirt for us. And it's this like, look what I'm gonna show you moment. Um, so I wanted him to be as predatorial, beast-like. Um, I wanted him to be like that scene in A Clockwork Orange when they go after that family. Like if I, wanted, if I could paint that scene into a face, that was the, that was the face I was going for. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Laura. Yeah, that was thanks. wonderful. Thanks, guys. And uh, thanks once again to Ashley and to Heather uh, for um, introducing us to their work as well tonight. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you for coming. And also, if you have, uh, if you'd like to come back next week, um, you, uh, if you please like sign up uh, at the front desk, RSVP for next week. That's helpful. So we'd love to see you here again. Um, so thanks again, and have a great night. <laughs>